Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Is this on? Yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, it's good to see many of you here this Sunday afternoon after hopefully a packed weekend of, um, of Human Rights Watch events already. Um, my name is Nadja Groot, and I work for the Democracy and Media Foundation here in Amsterdam. Um, the Democracy and Media Foundation has been a proud supporter of Human Rights Watch's work uh, for years, actually, including the work on Turkey um, in the past two years. So I'm very happy to be here. And um, we'll, we'll be having a conversation um, taking stock of the human rights situation in Turkey uh, for the next hour and a half or so. Um, I'm by no means an expert on Turkey, so I'm very happy that we have three experts here um, who can tell us um, all about it. Um, we've got Benjamin Ward at the end of the panel. And Benjamin is um, Human Rights Watch Dep Deputy Director for Europe and Central Asia. Um, and as such is responsible for um, the research and advocacy work in Europe, um, or the European region, I should say, Western Balkans and Turkey. Um, we've got Tantun Ali, who's been uh, working as a journalist on Turkey um, for quite some time now, for a couple of years, who's been based in the country for about three years, right? Between um, 2013, 2016. Um, and whose work has appeared in, uh, in amongst others, Trouw and, and Groen Amsterdammer here in the Netherlands. Um, and we've got Kati Piri, who's a member of the European Parliament for the Labour Party, um, is a rapporteur for Turkey, more importantly in this situation, <laughs> um, and who's been uh, a very critical about the developments in Turkey and EU-Turkey relations um, since, um, happening since the coup. Um, we've structured this as a, as, as a conversation um, among experts, so there's no keynotes, no PowerPoints. Um, so I, I, I suggest also kind of that you uh, try and save the questions maybe until the end of the um, conversation. If there's any questions for clarification or um, that are very pressing issues, please do your, raise your hand and we'll try to accommodate them um, in between. Um, yeah, maybe let's start. Let's start with the, with the reports, I guess. We've, um, we've talked before um, to start with, with an introduction of Human Rights Watch's work. Um, and I think in the last quarter of last year, um, you published a report that was based on interviews with, with families, with victims of, of people that have um, experienced torture um, in custody. Um, and when we were talking before, you were saying that, um, that a lot of what you saw kind of during the reports were maybe developments and practices that we haven't seen in Turkey for some time. So. Um, we thought kind of th this would m be a good start, uh, yeah, to kind of set, uh, set the scene for this conversation. Could you maybe tell us a bit more about, I mean, the study, what you've been looking for, what you found, um, and also maybe kind of why what we're seeing now is um, different? Yes, I'm happy to. I hope everyone can hear me okay. So this is a report which we published last October um, and it's a report about uh, torture and ill treatment in police custody. Um, it, the, almost all the cases happened in 2017. And um, as Nadia said, one important thing to understand when we talk about this report is that uh, Turkey does have historically a, a, a poor record of torture in custody. Um, but uh, as a result of uh, reforms that have been put into place, there had been a very significant reduction of uh, torture in custody from the period of about 2002 to about 2015, 2016. Um, and what we saw uh, after the coup, however, were um, an alarming increase in the number of uh, reports of torture happening in police custody. In other words, happening in the period immediately after people are first taken into detention and before they are uh, charged with anything, before they're brought before a judge or, or transferred to uh, prison custody. Uh, we published a report on this in October 2016, and that report uh, found that, that one of the um, uh, reasons why we were seeing this increase was that under the state of emergency which the Turkish government passed after the uh, failed coup in the middle of 2016, they used uh, powers that they had under the state of emergency to weaken a number of the safeguards 
that existed to protect people from torture and police detention. Uh, that included uh, increasing the amount of time that a person could be held before they had to be brought before a judge, increasing the amount of time they could be held before they had to be seen by a lawyer. Um, and the, these kinds of um, uh, safeguards are very important to reduce the, uh, the incidence of torture. So we published that report in, in, uh, in 2016, as I said, and then we returned to the issue uh, about nine months later because we were getting uh, increasing numbers of uh, reports of torture in police custody again. Um, many of these uh, cases relate to people who are accused of being members of uh, the Gulen movement, which is a, um, um, a movement of people who follow a cleric who lives in the United States and which the government accuses of being responsible for the coup and uh, describes as a terrorist organization. Um, and we'll talk more about the implications of being associated or perceived to be associated with the movement later, I think. So th these cases involve people being uh, subject to the most appalling treatment in, in police custody. I'll, I'll read for you in a moment um, a testimony we took from the wife of one of the victims whose case we feature in the report. But what was also very disturbing to me uh, as we were preparing this report was that uh, lawyers that we were speaking to who'd, at, who'd represented a number of these victims said that they themselves were under pressure uh, from the police for having acted in these cases. Uh, in some cases, they were threatened um, with prosecution themselves. Uh, in cases where they were uh, speaking to their uh, clients in custody, there were police officers present the whole time so that the uh, uh, clients were not able to speak freely. We also found, and this is something we found in the, in the previous report, that um, there was also interference with the gathering of medical evidence that might substantiate uh, claims of torture. So in some cases, um, lawyers were, were denied uh, medical reports that might have um, been consistent with the physical injuries that their clients received as a result of police torture. In other cases, uh, the, um, the, 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 the prisoners were seen by um, uh, state-affiliated doctors who then wrote reports saying that they had no injuries, even though the lawyers reported to us that the clients had visible injuries as a, which they had incurred in police custody. So that's, I think, a very worrying element, that it's not just about incidents of torture, but it's also about the authorities trying to cover up what's happening to frustrate the attempts of those people who are trying to bring it to light. And unfortunately, um, the, uh, another critical aspect of trying to reduce the incidents of torture is to investigate and hold to account uh, public officials who are responsible for it. But in the case of these incidents in Turkey since the coup, both the, those we documented in our 2016 report and the 2017 report, there, in most cases there was no investigation at all by the uh, uh, prosecuting authorities. And in the few cases where there were um, investigations, the investigations didn't lead anywhere and nobody was held to account. And the consequence of that is that it sends a signal to uh, police officers that uh, there will be no uh, ramifications, there will, be no, there will be no fallout if you engage in these abusive practices. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's very, very significant in terms of uh, sending a message that torture is okay. Before we move on, I just, I just want to give you, uh, read to you briefly a, a section of this um, interview with uh, uh, one of the victims of torture's wife about, about his ordeal. Um, his name is uh, Hassan uh, Kobele. When I visited him, in, visited him in prison, my husband told me what had happened to him in police custody. He had lost a lot of weight and was exhausted. He cried and, sent, and said he felt ashamed. I am finished, he said. He told me he had been tortured. I wanted to boost his morale, but how could I? 
he was changed completely. When he spoke at the court hearing, it was hard to hear all he said, but he described the insults, being stripped naked, being blindfolded and gagged, having his sexual organs squeezed. My husband cried as he recounted it in court. The judge didn't stop him speaking. The police sitting in the courtroom took notes in detail and stared at us threateningly. Those are the kinds of incidents that we have documented. And I think it, 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 it shows the, the devastating consequences that, that torture has on, vic on the victims and also on their families. And um, unfortunately, as I said, the, the, a lot of the work that was done to try to reduce uh, incidents of torture and to put into place reforms to, to make it less likely um, have, been, have been weakened. And we now have a climate in which uh, those people who are regarded as, as enemies of the government um, are at real risk of this kind of treatment. Thank you. That's, that's a very disheartening um, quote to kind of uh, end with. But um, maybe, kind of, maybe we could broaden the conversation and bring in Tan. Um, you've also been in. Um, I mean, traveling to Turkey and talking to a lot of uh, family members and, and uh, military um, um, personnel, I should say, people. Mm. Um, people who have been affected by, um, by the, the repercussions post-coup. Post um, so we might not be take, talking about kind of torture explicitly, but could you relate a bit kind of on what the experience of, of, um, of the people have been kind of that you've talked to? Yeah, maybe you're referring to um, cadets. Uh, I wrote mm -hmm. an article just after the coup mm -hmm. uh, when many people uh, from the military academies in Istanbul uh, who had... No, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, people from the military academy in Istanbul who had occupied the bridge were all taken in. And indeed, then we spoke to family members. And uh, yeah, in a way, I think it's symbolic. And these people, they were no, no part of... Uh, some big plot to, mm. to overthrow the government, but they were just there and they were uh, abiding the, by the orders of their uh, superiors. Uh, and after that, we have seen, of course, that uh, tens of thousands of people have uh, been uh, taken into custody or uh, lost their jobs. Uh, main, often the media is represented as if these are mainly people affiliated with the Gulen movement, but it's, of course, much broader. Um, all kinds of opposition, leftist, uh, uh, Kurdish activists, uh, they lost their jobs. And um, the consequences are uh, very big for having a stigma, you know, when you lose your job. Uh, I, I think of teachers that I spoke to. Um, when you lose your job, you have this stigma and people wouldn't want to be affiliated with you. Often your passports are revoked, your bank accounts are being frozen, uh, and it's very hard to uh, pick up your life and move on and find another job because people as I said, don't want to be affiliated with you. Yeah. And there's this climate indeed that ben Benjamin mentioned where, uh, yeah, anybody who has lost their job or who is uh, 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 pointed out as a Gulenist or as a related to the, the PKK, the, Kur the, Kur the Kurdish uh, opposition, um, yeah, has this stigma and, and yeah, it's, it's very hard to carry on life with yeah. such a stigma. Mm -hmm. Have you been able, as a journalist, to talk to kind of people that, that have also maybe been through um, pre-trial detention or have been held, mm -hmm. uh, and that have experienced um, more or less what Benjamin described, um, and who are willing to talk about it afterwards? Mm, I didn't particularly uh, uh, sp speak to people that were uh, tortured or ill-treated uh, uh, in, in prison, in custody. Um, but yeah, Benjamin spelled it out uh, very well that there's in, in Turkey an environment where anything goes. Uh, and when people uh, that carry out uh, torture, police officers, and uh, are not have the feeling that they can do this without being punished, this is, of course, a very dangerous uh, development. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, the numbers we hear are tens of thousands, more than 100,000 people. But the, the, it's good to stress that the effect is it's much wider, of course. These people all have family members, uh, colleagues. Uh, so it's a really considerable part of society that uh, was affected after the, by the coup crackdown, after post-coup crackdown. Yeah. 
Maybe, Katia, also you've, you've travelled to Turkey and, well, and tried to directly after the coup, <laughs> um, were, um, well, I, I was about to say detained, which is not the right word, no, uh, held at the border. <laughs> no. Also not held at the border, but I was not welcome. Not able to yeah. go. Um, well, I went. They just told me I'm not welcome, but I did go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that, that correction is very welcome. <laughs> um, I think kind of on, on numerous occasions, uh, yeah, you've also kind of been able to uh, talk with a vi very wide range of parties. Um, to what extent kind of do, I mean, both accounts, I guess, they're, they're slightly different, but does this resonate with what your, what your experience is? Yes, I mean, uh, it's, it's my job as, um, as rapporteur for the European Parliament, of course, to always talk to all the political parties inside Turkey, but also with civil society organizations, uh, with trade unions, with all the segments that, um, you know, that form the basis of, 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 uh, Tur of Turkish society. And uh, I would dare to say one third or half of my usual interlocutors are behind bars by now. So uh, that, I think, uh, very much uh, you know, tells you about the situation. I think it's important to say that the moment the coup attempt happened, and uh, I do think we underestimated the impact that had on Turkish society, um, not at all justifying what's happening, but we also didn't understand how, what the impact was of that night on the mentality of a lot of people, the fear that a lot of people went through. And we are seeing the impact now, right? One and a half, two years later. Everything became a security issue in Turkey. Every aspect of life is being securitized. And um, um, with the state of emergency, normally a state of emergency after such an event, like you saw, for instance, in, in France happening, is very specific about the threat that caused you know, that caused, for instance, the group of people who are behind the coup attempt or behind the terrorist attack. But Turkey, actually, the moment they announced the state of emergency, they announced it absolutely very, very wide. So not just relating to the events happening on 16 July, but leaving any opposition. Sorry? 15, right? 15 July, yeah. But leaving in 2016, yeah. But, but leaving, um, uh, leaving a broad scope for it. And the moment, actually, um, all these laws that we are talking about are so-called decree laws. They are made by a cabinet of ministers without the parliament. Officially, they would have, have to have a say about it, but they don't. So one day you, you open the paper and you see your name suddenly on it as a person who has been fired by decree law. And uh, as Tan already explained, this means not only that you lost your job, your insurance, um, um, your pension, everything that goes with it, without even being able to protect yourself or know exactly what's the reason why you have been fired. But even in the private sector, no one will hire you. Mm. And by now we are talking about more than 100,000 people who have been dismissed, who have been fired from their job, more than 50,000 people who have been jailed in the last uh, one and a half year. And like Tan said, if you only look at the narrow family and, and, and friends of these people, we're already talking about one and a half, two million people of Turkish society who are directly affected by it. Um, we have parliamentarians in jail, colleagues of mine, 10 members of the Turkish parliament, nine of them from the Kurdish opposition party and one of them from the secular opposition party. Um, we have um, the biggest number of journalists jailed, unfortunately, in Turkey. While this was not a situation that we saw over the last 15 years, unfortunately, Turkey is again topping, topping that list. We have one third of the judiciary which have been fired. We have more than 4,000 academics who have been dismissed uh, from their jobs. I mean, the impact is huge, not just in the army, where logically you would think you know, that's where it hit because it was, of course, the coup somehow came from within a segment, a segment of the army. But throughout the whole society, if you look at how many women rights organizations have been closed down, how many civil society organizations um, um, had, the same, had the same fate. Uh, one of the key leaders of Turkish civil society, Osman Kavala, and a good friend, was put behind bars three months ago. Um, with very vague charges and there's, you know, we are kind of sometimes losing hope that even if it's so clear that someone is not guilty, 
um, unfortunately, you still see that uh, there's not a lot you can do in order to, to help that person. Yeah. I think, I mean, I th I'm, I'm grateful that you highlight kind of the, would you want to respond to that? Yeah. No, maybe Sorry. It's, it's yeah. a small addition. Go ahead. Uh, Kati mentioned that everything has become a security issue. Yeah. But this, it was indeed such an impactful event with which also everything can be legit legitimized. Mm -hmm. uh, so always uh, the coup is taken as a point of reference with which uh, the people that are now uh, have lost their jobs or are in prison, um, yeah, their imprisonment can be justified. Yeah. The, the argument is like, yeah, would we want uh, something like that to happen again? No, we don't. So these are the measures that we have to take. Mm. Of course, it's, <laughs> it's uh, an argument you cannot really take serious, but because of the impact the coup had, it resonates very strongly with many people in Turkish society. Yeah, I think I was wondering a bit about this. Maybe I'm not sure if it makes sense at this point, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> uh, because I think that argument, kind of, of, of um, um, if there's an association with a terrorist organization or um, you being associated with the coup, kind of that that type of those two lines of suspicion are being used to discredit and dismay um, everything and everyone that's critical, right? Um, but I guess kind of all, so all the critical voices. Um, that would say otherwise have been silenced more or less. So the sort of the sound that you uh, hear as a, a reader uh, or a media consumer in Turkey is probably the only, mm -hmm. is kind of state sound and is only state propaganda. I was wondering, um, I was wondering kind of what that does for um, maybe levels of trust in media um, for for the people kind of that that consume it and that kind of mm -hmm. that, yeah. If you'd if you'd be able to speak to that. Yeah, the, the level of trust, uh, indeed, like uh, as Kati mentioned, so many people uh, have been imprisoned, uh, politicians and many journalists. Still, many journalists are trying to do their jobs uh, mm. very bravely. Uh, it's very difficult. They have very little outlet. Sometimes they uh, have been fired and they try to start their own outlet to, uh, on YouTube or on uh, social media. But it's not so easy to make that uh, viable. Um, <sighs> Yeah, there, it's hard to talk in general terms about this, I think, because many parts and, and, and of society and parts of the country uh, have access mainly to the, the mainstream media, which are, yeah, there's hardly any critical voice left, like uh, th thinking of the, the referendum uh, that we'll come to talk about maybe. Um, even if the HDP MPs uh, would have been outside and be able to campaign uh, for a no vote, uh, they would hardly have been heard mm -hmm. because simply there are very few outlets left uh, that would voice uh, su such, a, such, a, such a voice. Um, so yeah, the, many, many, many uh, parts of society mainly consume the mainstream media. Other opposition parts uh, try to uh, use other uh, sources, but there's very little left. Mm -hmm. And maybe when we talk about the media, it's important to mention that, especially in the southeast uh, of the country, many media outlets have been closed. Uh, foreign journalists uh, very rarely travel uh, to the southeast, where, of course, in 2015-16, there was a, a, a yeah. fighting going on. So, and also a lot of human rights abuses or uh, suspects of, of, of human rights abuses. And we don't really know what is happening there because of this crackdown on the media. I mean, I think, just building on that point, I think one of the, one of the explanations as to why we now see civil society organizations so much in the frame of you know, the targets of the government and, and, and also academics is actually because of the success of the government in removing critical voices in the media that actually leaves civil society groups as the, you know, an important sort of residual critical voice and again, you know, uh, and, and academics as well. So it's sort of um, the, the, the media having been largely effectively silenced, you know, the sort of the, the, the state has moved on to kind of, you know, secondary uh, critical voices, if you like, secondary targets, as well, I think, crucially, as the, as the opposition um, parties, um, you know, that, that's a very important story which hasn't been particularly well uh, reported outside the country, but, is, but is, you know, it, is creating a situation where, you know, bit by bit, all of the checks and balances on the executive are being weakened, um, not just formally through the referendum, which we'll talk about later, but 
you know, as institutions. And that's, that's one of the most worrying aspects, I think, for me. Could you elaborate a bit more on kind of the dismantling of checks and balances that are that is not necessarily related to the um, to the referendum? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about checks and balances in a, you know in a, in a broad sense. So I mean, you have and obviously, I mean, Katie's talked about you know how under the state of emergency, the parliament is effectively bypassed because the government can rule by decree. So that's one example. You know, the government has been very successful in. Uh, in, in, in ridding the, the judicial system of, of judges and prosecutors who it regards as being having ties to Glenis, but at the same time that's also given it the opportunity to consolidate its influence over the judiciary so that the judiciary increasingly acts at the behest of the state. Um, you know, we've, we've had some, some recent examples of, of that. Um, again, the media is another important you know, a, a, a pillar of, I, I would argue, a check and balance against the executive excess. That's been weakened, as, as Tan has said. Civil society groups, I would say, are another check against the excess of the authorities, uh, executive authority, and, and they have been weakened. And then also going back to the parliament, um, you know, you've got the, the two, uh, uh, at the time, co-leaders of the second largest, uh, third largest uh, opposition party in the country, you know, in pre-trial detention. Um, at one stage in 2017, I think there were 13 MPs from that party in, in detention. Um, and the way in which that happened was that their, their parliamentary immunity was lifted just for a brief period of time so that they could be prosecuted, and then, and then it was restored again. Uh, and a few other MPs from other part, from from the ruling party and from the secular opposition party also had their um, immunity lifted. But and then and then as a related matter, uh, in the southeast, you've got hundreds and hundreds of elected mayors who have been removed from their post um, from a sister party to the to the HDP uh, on the grounds that they are you know somehow connected to the PKK and connected to terrorism. Um, so you have people, you know, large sections of the population in the southeast and other parts of the country have lost their democratic voice because their elected representatives have been removed mm. or, or are, you know, effectively barred from serving as their representatives because they're in prison subject to criminal procedure. Yeah. And if I, if I can add just to what Benjamin said, because, you know, for instance, this lifting of the immunity of MPs, which allowed actually the prosecutors to put them behind bars, and of course they only picked the ones they wanted behind bars, uh, already started before the coup attempt. And I think it's very important to highlight here, it's not that suddenly everything changed with the coup attempt. You know, we already had very worrying signs in Turkey. It just came into a much larger scale and much more rapid um, um, effect than, than, than before. But we already, you know, uh, when, when, when I look into the Parliament's report before the coup attempt was already very critical when we already saw, um, um, you know, huge pressure on, on, on certain groups, on media groups. You cannot compare it to, to what's happening today, um, but there was already a trend. Um, uh, which you could see before uh, 15 July 2016. I think if we look at maybe um, kind of the, the trends that have been um, exacerbated in, uh, in the post-school period, um, I think you both kind of, or all three of you, uh, mentioned the developments around the constitutional courts and the, the cases kind of that, um, in which it played out sort of uh, both for human rights defenders, um, the amnesty director uh, in Turkey, um, and the two journalists. Uh, would that be something kind of that, that you, Katy, would want to elaborate on? Yeah, well, to start with a positive point, <laughs> although um, I think by now it's being judged that 90% of the media is somehow in hands or under control of the government, uh, you had under the state of emergency, you had the referendum on a new constitution, right? And even despite all those circumstances, <coughs> officially, just a little bit less than half of the people voted against it. Mm -hmm. Probably under normal circumstances, there would have been a much bigger majority voting against it, actually. It, it, um, and, and this, for me, is, is the positive part of Turkish society. Despite of all this happening, 
um, um, you know, people had a long enough period of um, of modernization and and and, and democracy to to uh, very well know how not to judge the media now, for instance, on some of the propaganda that is there. When it comes to um, uh, what's happening now, the structural basis. Um, three weeks ago, the Constitutional Court of Turkey, which is by definition the highest court uh, possible you can get, um, um, made, a, made a decision that two um, journalists had to be released immediately because according to them they were not held uh, rightfully. And uh, the moment this happened, the, the lower court, uh, um, a lower court, I think it was in Istanbul, uh, decided to say, well, we don't respect this decision by the Constitutional Court, which is, um, you know, which is, I think, exemplary of the rule of law right now in Turkey. How can a lower court decide that a Constitutional Court judgment will not be implemented? And not only that, but the whole government the next morning was standing uh, at a press conference saying that the Constitutional Court could not have made this judgment. And unfortunately, until the day of today, these journalists are not released. So there's a huge question, which domestic remedy do people still have, you know, if a lower court is actually convicting you in Turkey, that you can still really have your case heard at a higher court if there is a judgment by the Constitution and the whole government and everyone is just accepting that, well, this was just the Constitutional Court, it's politically not liked, so these people will not be released. And then you had last week the case of um, Amnesty International Chair, you had the Istanbul 10, the 10 human rights defenders um, uh, who were uh, in prison, some of them were uh, released on bail a couple of, uh, couple of months ago, but the, the chair, Tana Kilic, was still in jail. There was a decision by a judge uh, to um, release him on bail, waiting so he could wait in freedom for uh, for the next uh, court case. Immediately, uh, the prosecutor filed through another court um, a request to um, a request to rearrest him, and in the end, 24 hours later, the next morning, the same judge who the day before said he should be released on bail suddenly changed his mind and said, no, no, he should stay in prison. So in the end, uh, he spent the night in police custody. Um, uh, his family was waiting in Izmir in front of the prison to finally see their father and their husband again after, uh, after so many months. And uh, they didn't have the chance, and he's again, um, he's again behind bars. And I think these are structural problems we are seeing in Turkey that really um, it's very difficult to speak of any type of rule of law left, even though I'm sure there are judges who try to take their job seriously and, and judge based on the court case in front of them. Mm -hmm. But you can have a heavy price if you do that. Uh, we, hear, we know many judges who have not been fired but been replaced, for instance, to the other side of the country in a small village. Uh, that means you have to move your whole family because uh, some people didn't like the judgments uh, they made. And then, yeah, then you're lucky actually, because of course, indeed, many people, uh, many judges have been uh, taken uh, in or uh, lost their job. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, the political pressure has been gradually building up. Uh, I remember, of course, the, the case of John Dundar, yeah. who was also set, uh, freed uh, by a, a decision by the Constitutional Court, and thereafter, President Erdogan saying, I don't uh, respect this decision. Uh, so, indeed, before the coup already, the judiciary uh, was under uh, heavy pressure and has been building up. And now, this is the perfect example, I think, uh, the decision of uh, Tanya Kilic, of a judge who, because of the charges against him are uh, mm -hmm. factually not true and absurd, um, who says, the judge says, uh, according to law, he has to be freed. Um, but then, the other day, after a political intervention, he has to rule to take him in again. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think maybe kind of this is a nice kind of uh, point in which to do, do bring in the referendum because I think these sort of practices also emerge from sort of emergency rule, right? And, and uh, a lot of this is um, being consolidated at the moment or kind of at the point where, where, um, where this is enshrined in law uh, or constitutional reform. Um, 
Ben, would you, could you maybe kind of remind us of, of what people voted on uh, in the referendum? Yeah. <laughs> maybe not point by point, Yeah, I mean, the, the non-technical bits. Effectively, what, what the referendum does is it takes, I would say, it, it takes the, the, the structures that were put in place uh, that, that exist under the state of emergency and it, 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 it more or less makes them permanent. I mean, the other thing that it does is it, it turns the, the nature of the democratic system in Turkey from a, from a prime minister-based system into a presidential system. Previously, the, historically, the, I mean, historically you know, until recently, the, the presidency was a largely ceremonial role in Turkey and the prime minister was the head of government and, the, and, and uh, appointed the cabinet. Um, uh, since uh, Erdogan became the, the president, he has exercised the powers that previously were that he exercised as prime minister, and arguably perhaps even more as as the president. Um, but constitutionally, he didn't actually have those powers. Um, so what the what the, the change the constitutional referendum will will do after the next elections when it comes into force will be to, to give the presidency, formally speaking, the powers that, that Erdogan arguably exercises already in practice, um, including the, the power to appoint ministers directly, um, and also the power to, uh, to, 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 in some cases, uh, make law directly by decree without having to go through a parliamentary process. Um, but I think the key, you know, a, a key thing to say there, in addition to I think the very important point about the fact that the, the referendum outcome was not was not uh, was actually quite close, despite the, the very negative context in which it was held. Um, but the other key thing I think to say is really that the um, in practice that the powers that the that will be granted to the presidency under the new uh, uh, constitutional arrangements are already being exercised in practice by uh, by the current president um, and um, yeah and uh, the other thing which I wanted to mention I think I think it's very good that um, that, that, that Cathy mentioned um, France certainly the the state of emergency powers in France is something that uh, the Turkish government has has pointed to um, as a justification for its own powers even though the state of emergency powers in France basically are about the ability of the police to carry out law enforcement actions without judicial authorization, and which Human Rights Watch has been very critical of, by the way. But they don't give the president the power to rule by decree and, with, and, and, to, and remove the uh, scrutiny powers of the constitutional court in a way that the state of emergency in Turkey does. But I do think that, you know, I hope we'll have space to talk about the European Union and the, and one of the ways in which the European Union uh, under, perhaps lacks the credibility that it once had in terms of engaging with Turkey on these issues is the fact that you have very very problematic practices by EU governments to erode checks and balances you know in Poland and Hungary that are not really being dealt with by the EU you know, they may not be to the same degree, um, but this idea that you're not just committing human rights abuses in the, in the particular, but you're actually trying to weaken and take away the constitutional framework that, that constrains the government from engaging in, in abusive practices, that's not confined to Turkey and Europe. And I think, you know, if, if Europe, if the European Union wants to be credible engaging with Turkey on these issues, it also has to look at its own domestic uh, internal, you know, track record on this, actually. I guess that's yeah. a call for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when you, I agree. But more went wrong with Turkey and EU than just that. Um, you know, when, when do you have, when, when are you attractive for a country which is a candidate country to become a member of the EU? if that candidacy is credible, right? And um, I think uh, when the negotiations started with Turkey in 2004, we already then had a French President Sarkozy and a German President Merkel 
who said, well, we can start these negotiations, but they should never lead, lead to full membership. Um, that's one of the issues. So, you know, and we even said, even if Turkey fulfills all the criteria, unlike the Balkan countries, we will decide then whether it can really become a full member. So, of course, your carrot was from the beginning already smaller uh, than in previous, in previous enlargements. I'm not saying that's the reason why things are happening in Turkey now, but that's one of the reasons why the EU does not have the attractiveness, the political attractiveness to Erdogan, um, as it might have had them, you know, at the, at the early years. Um, apart from that, we, had, uh, we have an issue that we blocked all the accession negotiation chapters, not because of human rights abuses in Turkey, but more or less most of them were blocked because of Cyprus. Cyprus became a member of the EU. Each member state can block opening chapters. I won't go too much into detail, but just to tell you, you know, the EU also made sure we wanted to have, uh, um, we cut ourselves in the finger. And then so many years later when things go so wrong in Turkey and, and you know, you wonder why all our concerns are not being taken seriously, I think it's good to also look at our track record of, of credibility mm -hmm. of the EU vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis Turkey. Um, we, we also do have, we do treat Turkey differently than some other countries, uh, perhaps not fairly, but it is a country of 80 million. If here in the Netherlands we, organi we would organize a debate about do you want Turkey to become a member of the EU, I can tell you it will be an extremely heated debate, and that will probably be less heated if we do it about one of the Balkan countries which has 3 million population. So um, uh, the attractiveness, we lost it to Erdogan, but I don't think we lost it to a majority of the Turkish population. And we are risking to lose them now. And that is my fear. I think we have lost Erdogan a long time ago uh, when it comes to someone who wants to modernize, reform the country in a democratic way. But a lot of people inside Turkey, and not just those people who voted no in the referendum, also among AK Party voters, young people um, uh, in the cities um, uh, in, in Turkey who do see their future much more linked to the European Union than to any other part, uh, any other part of the world. And this is the time then to be tough when the government has policies which are really bad, and I think we can be tougher there but also have a line of solidarity with all those people, and there are millions who are going through an extremely difficult time now, be it because you are targeted under the decree laws, be it there were so many terrorist attacks uh, in 2016, 2017 happening in all the major cities in Turkey, uh, be it because you belong to a ethnic or religious minority which is under pressure in Turkey, and we should also you know, this is also the time the EU should so show that solidarity uh, with those people because I think it's a much bigger risk to lose a large part of a population in Turkey mm -hmm. than to lose a president who, as all of us, will one day uh, not be there anymore. I think this could be kind of a nice way. Um, maybe I'll like. I, I I was wondering if you wanted to respond, Tan. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I recognize a bit what uh, what Kati says, and I think indeed it's a it's a big danger to lose the population or the hope, like in the early years of the accession process, many people were very hopeful because they had this feeling that the EU on a human rights level could do something for them and, uh, you know, uh, expand uh, rights. But now, uh, in my experience, also talking to people in Turkey, this hope is long gone, actually. Mm. Um, and the elephant in the room, maybe, that uh, you were uh, pointing at was, of course, the feeling of uh, Turkey uh, always uh, waiting, yeah? the, the Christian club argument, uh, they don't want us because we're an Islamic country. Um, yeah, the, and maybe, I mean, you've, you could also have mentioned the, the refugee deal, the EU-Turkey deal, where uh, attached to this deal, uh, certain chapters were opened and there was this talk about, uh, right? Or they wanted the, to, but in the end, the EU didn't. No. But Cyprus I think, it. yeah. Yes. But sorry, yeah. But yeah. this was, I think, very dangerous because yes. Turkey was already uh, on its path to a uh, very autocratic rule, and to connect these because of the mm -hmm. st stakes, the common stakes that they had in the, uh, stemming the refugee flow, uh, to connect the EU accessions uh, talks to this deal. Yeah, 
I think, I mean, this is kind of, I think, a segue into moving forward uh, in a way, or the road ahead, I think, as, as it was called. Um, but if you look at, I mean, clearly in this conversation or in this setup, uh, the European Union is a really is an actor that we should look at a bit more closely. And I think you've already alluded to um, the accession procedure perhaps not being so, I, I think that's kind of widely uh, understood as maybe being less attractive uh, for, for Erdan as a, as a carrot at the moment. Um, I guess the big question is then, I mean, what remains of the, of the leverage in the sort of the package and the tools that the EU has at, at its disposal? And also, I think particularly if you're saying the government is, what, is one thing, but there's also kind of the population, what kind of, on the one hand, like what would the impact be if, if you say we, we kind of put this procedure at, on hold entirely? Um, and how do you still sort of draw in the population while kind of uh, being tough on the government? A lot of questions. Let me, let me, sorry. No, 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 <laughs> but break them down. Um, in the Parliament, in the European Parliament, we have said that if this new constitutional package will be implemented in 2019, that's the moment we should officially suspend the accession mm -hmm. talks. I'm not under the illusion that this will help anyone in Turkey. So let me be clear on that. But I also think the EU has a credibility issue. And if we don't stop under those circumstances formally talking about accession with this government in Turkey, then I don't think we have a lot of credibility left. Because what is a red line then? Um, so it, this is not a measure to show solidarity with the Turkish people because a lot of people in Turkey under pressure don't want these accession talks to be stopped because they say this is our only hope for the future actually that you know somehow when things will go better in Turkey we can restart this process even if the outcome might not be accession the process for them is an anchor of reform so uh, but I, of course, as as member of, of, of the European Parliament, I also have uh, the feeling that we have to also represent the credibility and uphold the credibility of the European Union. What we can do now at the macro level is not a lot. I mean, the accession talks are kind of, are kind of uh, frozen. Mm -hmm. We're awaiting 2019 and what will happen. I think we have much more leverage in the economic field, which we are not always using. In the economic field, I don't mean sanctions, because the EU is not like Russia to use the economy in a political way. But uh, we have already, a, I won't go too much into detail, a customs union agreement with Turkey, uh, which both sides wanted to be modernized. And it's actually a very rule-based uh, agreement where Turkey will not be able to have a constitutional court ruling like this if it seriously wants to negotiate about such a deal, but to be honest, I also don't see that happening uh, very soon in the, in, the, in the coming months. So what we can do and what we have done is increase the number of student exchanges with the Erasmus program, for instance. Unfortunately, right now, there are not too many people from Europe students who want to go to Turkey, but we are trying to increase the number of possibilities for Turkish students to come uh, to the EU. All kind of exchange programs. We are looking with talking with universities also here in Holland, how they can offer um, places to academics from Turkey who have fled, or how to cooperate with academics who lost their jobs and are still inside Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to look at this societal level because this is, I think, uh, how we can uh, uh, show that solidarity much more now. I mean, for me, when it comes to the government, you, yes, you have to continue to talk, but you have to voice your key principles. And when there was this constitutional um, um, judgment uh, three weeks ago I told you about, the EU did not come out even with a statement. Mm -hmm. Although this is a structural problem which can have an impact on 80 million people living in Turkey, that the constitutional court rulings are no longer respected. That's the moment you have to step in. Uh, and on the other hand, continue to, continue to engage, continue to um, uh, clearly make the, the, the distinction between our opposition against the Turkish government's policies is not something anti-Turkish, is not something against the people of <coughs> Turkey. And that, as a last remark, that is, you know, the, the sad things. If things would go very well in Turkey, we could have a fierce debate here among political parties in Europe whether, you know, what should we do? <laughs> Democratic Turkey, what should we do? What kind of uh, 
engagement should we have with that country? But unfortunately, because things are going so bad in Turkey, from the extreme right to the center to the left, we kind of seem to have one messaging. And I think the progressive parties should be sure that they are, their messaging is not anti-Turkish. It's critical of Erdogan government and of their policies, but it's not anti-Turkish. Yeah. Maybe to briefly jump in here, uh, it's, it's uh, of course, uh, the only intention you can have as an EU rapporteur, but unfortunately we see that this gets lost in translation, this nuance, like Kati herself on a weekly basis is <laughs> targeted by members of the Turkish government uh, as someone who supports terror, uh, words are being uh, twitched. Um, so, yeah, with media also so much in the hands of the government, and, uh, yeah, the government has realized, and we have seen it in the run-up to the elections, that stirring up anti-Western, anti-European sentiment gains them votes, mm -hmm. and uh, knowing that we will have elections, uh, vital elections, uh, municipal, uh, parliamentary, and presidential elections in 2019, uh, during which these uh, constitutional amendments uh, that the uh, Turkish people, vote, uh, people in Turkey voted on uh, last year will have to be implemented. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't vote so well. I'm afraid that, in, again, we will see uh, Erdogan trying to use this anti-Western sentiment. Now also, uh, uh, along with that, there's a war going on and the anti-Kurdish sentiment also for people to rally behind the nation and rally behind a big leader. Um, so it, it's a very tough job for uh, people within EU institutions to, to, to voice their concerns. What is it that you expect, I think, from kind of uh, the fact that this is sort of an election year uh, coming up and, and also um, I think previously you also indicated or flagged that potentially, you know, like, yes, Erdogan might not be that interested in Europe as, a, as, an, as an actor, uh, comparatively, and kind of with the, the, the war he's, he's starting now uh, um, um, in, in Syria, basically, in the Kurdish region, um, that he's, he might be shifting f focus intentionally also kind of to stir um, sentiments, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, what, what is your in, uh, expectation for kind of the next year and a half, if you yeah, think politically, yes? Yeah, well, indeed, the, the, the campaign, I think, for the, the, the elections has started because uh, Erdogan and his prime minister are touring the country, they're making reference to these elections, uh, that they're important, that they have to be won. And I, 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 before I was making a parallel, maybe I can also make it explicit here, in 2015, there were parliamentary elections. Mm. Uh, and for the first time in the AK Party rule, uh, the AK Party has lost its, parliament, lost its parliamentary majority. Um, the, the HCP, uh, the, the, the Kurdish party of which the leaders are now in prison, uh, passed the threshold and that was uh, instrumental in uh, AK Party losing its majority. And then what happened? A war started uh, in the southeast. Yeah. It resumes. And uh, indeed, uh, a bit like you see now, uh, nationalist sentiment was stirred and uh, the argument was made, look, uh, people are trying to divide our country, we have to rally behind the government, stability. Uh, and uh, a few months later, uh, there were re uh, new elections and the AK Party regained its majority in parliament. And I, looking ahead, I would say that a similar trend might uh, take place. We have seen during the... Uh, uh, during the referendum uh, that under such uh, difficult circumstances with a very slim major majority only the yes vote won mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, disputable uh, there were allegations of corruption um, what, what, what I would expect to happen if this war continues and uh, people the government continues to try to rally uh, people behind uh, the army and the nationalist sentiment uh, indeed, people uh, that have maybe before uh, voted against the government uh, would rally behind the government again. Yeah, this is uh, something that I think might happen. Yeah, I mean, in terms of sort of looking ahead, um, I think a lot of what I was going to say has been said already, but, but a, a few things to emphasize. I, you know, this is not, it's not just about the European Union. There are other... Mm -hmm you know, regional and international institutions that are important in relation to Turkey. Um, particularly if we want to have an engagement which is actually based on human rights and the rule of law rather than a sort of political, politicized engagement. Um, you know, the, the Council of Europe now, Parliamentary Assembly has, has um, put
put Turkey under the monitoring procedure again, which you know, does provide an opportunity for a sort of structured scrutiny of its human rights record. The European Court of Human Rights is more important than ever as a, as a, as a safeguard for human rights in Turkey, particularly now that the Constitutional Court seems to be ignored by the lower courts in Turkey. You know, some of the, some of the UN mechanisms also can be, can be really important. And then I think in terms of what, what, you know, what we can do, what we should expect of our you know, governments, I, I do think taking a principled approach is really important and, and also you know, being willing to be a bit courageous. So for example, you know, one of the things that's, that I've noticed over the years is that the European Union, if someone is uh, arrested and, and, and put in prison on clearly politically motivated charges, um, you will you will often see statements from the U.S. government saying this person should be freed, unconditionally they should be freed. There's a recognition that this is a politically motivated charge. The European Union institutions tend to be much more cautious, and they will say they should be the case should be dealt with according to international fair trial standards, or, you know this this sort of thing. And of course, the response of that to the Turkish authorities is this is being dealt with under you know fair trial. We have an independent judiciary. In it. So I think there needs to be, a, you know, there could be a bit more backbone uh, from times. And, and also bilateral European government relations with Turkey are really important. I mean, the German relationship, you know, the, the, the sort of um, the relationship between France and, uh, and Turkey now under President Macron, I think, is, you know, is increasingly important. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just building a bit on Cathy's point about, you know, uh, keeping space in Turkey for the for, for people who are trying to move things in a positive direction. And that's about, you, know, you won't be surprised to hear me say, keep, you know, trying to do everything we can to preserve space for civil society. Turkey is really, really blessed with a very rich and vibrant civil society. And you know, if, if they have the space, uh, they, can, they can achieve a lot. But right now, they're really under unprecedented pressure. And I think, you know, we should be using we European institutions, European governments, European NGOs should be using all of the tools that we have to try to keep as much space for them as we can so that they can do their work. Are there any particular recommendations that you'd give to the EU institutions apart from <laughs> bold, um, bolder statements? <laughs> well, I, th I, I mean, I think, yeah. yeah, being willing to, being really willing to, you know, to, to, to say it like it is, you know, this is, these are trumped up charges, this is absurd, you know, th th this person should be freed, you know, that, that's important. Um, and, and again, having a, um, you know, having a, having a, having an engagement which is based on principle, so that it, because as, uh, you know, as Katy said, there are lots of people in, in Europe, you know, lots of European politicians for whom the repression, the current repression in Turkey is a gift because it gives them an opportunity to push Turkey away and to cloak it in the sort of uh, uh, mantle of, of, of human rights, when in fact they have no interest in, in closer relations with Turkey, they never have. Um, you know, obviously there are other people for whom, you know, who are genuinely interested in, in human rights progress in Turkey and, and you know, having European governments willing to be frank and to focus their messages on the need for human rights, compliance with human rights, adherence to human rights, and also the, 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 the institutional framework, you know, the, 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 the institution. So not just looking, on, looking at, in a sense, the outcomes. You know, so why is it that you know, we, we will criticize the fact that journalists are in prison, but we won't necessarily criticize the terrorism laws and the curbs on judicial independence that kind of make that possible. You know, that, that kind of wider lens, I think, is, is also really important. Mm. Yeah. Katia, I guess I would ask you um, a, a, a broader question um, in line uh, with kind of with the first one I start with, with, with Tan. Um, this being an election year also for the European Union uh, and ca kind of this, or not this, yeah, yes. next year, yeah. kind of the next year and a half, I guess, the next 18 months. Um, I guess it's a very politicized environment. 
how, how kind of what are the ways it, or what are the hopes and expectations maybe that you'd have kind of in terms of human rights monitoring and like being able to um, to sort of um, monitor and speak out in a very politicized environment. Well, my, my fear is that uh, although, for instance, in the parliament we said 2019 could be the year to, you know, take a drastic decision, but this year is 2018, right? So, um, although I don't see the positive signals in Turkey, let, let that be clear, I do think this is a year where we should try in any way to, to at least slow down the process or, or help some of our, our friends who are in, in, in difficult position in Turkey at least try to still use the tools that are available. Why I'm saying this, I'm afraid that uh, we go already into the pragmatic mode mm -hmm. when it comes to certain uh, heads of state. That, uh, you know, I'm afraid that the German government, the moment the Ger German journalist Denis Yuto is released, which would be great, uh, but then they go into the pragmatic mode, now how can we give it back? So let's talk talking about trade, let's talk about, you know. And I'm not saying we should boycott Turkey, but the situation is too serious uh, to, to just go into the pragmatic mode now. Already accepting, it's, it kind of seems that some you know, EU leaders are saying, well, Turkey is lost anyway in terms of human rights, it's just the way it will it will go, so we have to find a pragmatic way of to, to cooperate. Also, as, especially, of course, in the countries which have a huge Turkish minority inside mm -hmm. the country as well, like in the Netherlands, like in Germany, like in Belgium. Uh, and I think that would be really, really not fair to uh, millions of people inside Turkey who are still fighting and hoping that 2019 will not be the, the final turn to a very autocratic, undemocratic uh, Turkey for the long run. So I hope 2018 is a year where we are still trying uh, to, to, to reach out to, to at least, as a minimum, to slow down this process of, um, of autocratic rule. But for that, we need uh, EU leaders. We will have a debate next week in the European Parliament on Tuesday, specifically on human rights and the current human rights situation inside Turkey. Um, with very clear, explicit language. I'm sure, Benjamin, you would like that. Um, um, because it has, to be, it has to be mentioned. At the moment when in the headlines in the newspapers the last weeks before the offering operation, we could only read about approchement between the Turkish government and EU, now we are friends again. You know, I very much had the need, oh wait, but nothing changed inside country, inside, inside Turkey for all those human rights defenders. So we need to make sure that's on the top of the agenda. Um, and uh, that's why we have asked for the debate and we will have that with Federica Mogherini, the EU foreign policy mm -hmm. chief. Uh, and we will insist on monitoring these cases. I'm proud of six, seven EU member states, thank God, including the Dutch, who are always there with all these court cases. I think they are doing really a tremendous job by showing these people that they are not, you know, not forgotten. Um, um, you know, these are the things we should continue to do, stimulate in doing. And uh, I, I very much agree. The diplomatic language sometimes used by the EU, you know, no one understands the sentence anymore. Um, so I agree. We could uh, we could learn in that respect something from the Americans. Yeah. Um, and we shouldn't, yeah. we also just, we, we also shouldn't fall sort of victim to a kind of, you know, uh, low expectations. I mm -hmm. think we shouldn't become a kind of prisoner to low expectations. I think that's really important. I think before, I mean, we could open up to the audience, I think. We have about 15 to maybe 20 minutes left, uh, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. Um, but maybe there's kind of pressing, pressing issues that you'd want to kind of uh, raise before we do that, Stu? Time? Maybe, no. In that Let's case, see the pressing uh, issues. Questions. Pressing issues, audience. pressing hands. Maybe. Maybe I missed it, but I still don't really understand what, why the European uh, Union refrains from being harder. So you said, for instance, that the uh, economics sanctions are not used. Why, actually? What, what refrains uh, from being more American like we do, like American do, for instance, in Iran or in other countries, which are really put under pressure 
to boost the opposition, actually. Yeah. yeah. Shall I answer? Or? Should we, do, should we gather yeah, questions yeah, gather, or should yes. we do it in one? That's the question. Gather. Okay. I think so. Can it I makes make, more sense yeah, to do two or three at a yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Behind gather. you. Sorry, while, while we are on the American uh, clarity, I wonder if you could also address some of the impact. Uh, there's a lot of discussion now about how, of course, Trump's and his administration are giving kind of blank checks to, to strong men, not only Turkey, but, but elsewhere, um, and how the recent decision, of course, to throw the U.S. alliance behind what Turkey considers to be a terrorist organization in Syria and some of those effects beyond their borders, what kind of effect that, that is having internally. Hello. And I'd like to take you back to the um, idea of uh, the European Union um, sort of not sorting out their internal issues with uh, countries like Poland and uh, Hungary. What can be realistically done right now to actually sort it out? Okay. Okay. Should we take one more Let's, or like I take a three? Three is probably yeah. good. Yeah, let me, yeah. Of which two are EU targeted. Yeah. So, so I'm, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm happy to I'm happy to have a have a have a go. Um, so, I mean, I think actually both in the case of the European Union and also in the case of the U.S. government, they have a lot of interests, and there are a lot of different strands to their relationship with Turkey. There is, in the case of the EU, obviously, uh, as Tan mentioned, the uh, the EU Turkey migration deal. Um, and the desire to keep the uh, boat migration route across the Aegean to the Greek islands as, as, uh, as closed as possible. Um, there's, all, there's also, of course, the, the question of uh, security cooperation, particularly in relation to um, ISIS, which is, which is a very important aspect of, of, uh, of relations with Turkey, both for the uh, EU and US. There's the fact that Turkey is a NATO country and has, has military bases. Um, uh, so, you know, and then there's the very, very complicated question of uh, Syria's, uh, Turkey's role in the Syrian conflict, um, even before the current, the, the current uh, you know, further complication um, in, in Afrin. So, you know, I think all of that um, helps to explain why uh, human rights doesn't always figure particularly high up the agenda. Um, and certainly in the case of the, um, I, I would say this is less true now, but, but certainly I think in 2015, 2016, with the EU-Turkey deal, it, you know, the, the EU needed Turkey more than Turkey needed the EU p politically. And so, you know, the, the, that, that, and that also coincidentally, you know, was a was a was a period of uh, certainly 2016, a period of intensification of uh, the crackdown in, in Turkey itself. Um, so that may maybe partly partly to do with it. On on the U.S., um, I mean, interestingly, the State Department is still not not bad. Um, uh, I, I mean, we see this we see this. Um, Actually, in other parts of the region I work on, you know, the countries that the State Department has been, you know, fairly good in speaking about human rights issues in, it, it often continues to do. Whether that, you know, how important that is in the ambit of overall U.S. policy towards Turkey, I think, is another question. And as I was saying, I think there's a lot. It's a very, very complicated relationship, even more complicated now. It's also complicated by the fact that, you know, Turkey would very much like the U.S. to extradite uh, Fatullah Gulen, um, uh, and and you know that 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 kind of overshadows things. Um, on the on the question of the um, the EU's willingness to hold its own member states to account for for their own human rights abuses and weakening of rule of law, I, I mean there you really have to differentiate between Poland and Hungary. I mean, on Poland, you know the European Commission has. Uh, started the Article 7 proceeding under the uh, Treaty of the European Union, which, um, you know, is a, a, is a kind of political sanction 
Um, it's not one which is frankly likely to lead to the suspension of Poland's voting rights. But nevertheless, it's an important signal and we're very keen to see member states you know, support the Commission's work and that the Parliament has also played a really important role in that regard. On Hungary, unfortunately, there's much less willingness. I mean, the Parliament has been quite good, but the Commission <laughs> has been much more reticent and the, the member states have been very, very reluctant. And I think a, a big part of that has to do with the fact that the ruling party in, in Hungary is part of the European People's Party political group, in the, in the sort of, which is the main centre-right political group. And so it has much more political cover in the European Union context than the Polish government, which is part of a sort of far-right populist group, political group. Um, so actually, Human, Human Rights Watch has, 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 uh, has been arguing that um, uh, the European People's Party should expel uh, Fidesz, the ruling party, from the EPP because it doesn't actually um, meet the, uh, the values that the EPP uh, claims to represent. And, um, but, but that, I think, is why we don't see necessarily the same willingness to focus on the situation in Hungary. Would you want to add something? Yeah, I think I agree with everything you said, Benjamin. Um, um, perhaps with the addition on the, on the question of, um, you know, why was the EU not willing to do more, I agree with all the arguments said. Uh, but I still think this is a very short-term thinking, right? In the long run, I think a very unstable, undemocratic Turkey, which is our neighbor, is of much bigger threat to us than any of these short-term uh, short uh, agreements. So, um, unfortunately, this is the case. And uh, we have, for foreign policy inside the EU, you need 28 countries to agree. And unfortunately, we do not have one Turkey strategy. We have 28 strategies on how to deal with Turkey. The French is much different from the one in Berlin or let alone the one from Sofia or Budapest. So uh, this is the sadness, I say, as a politician who deals with foreign affairs inside the EU, where you could have, you know, you could have so much more impact if you wouldn't always need to look for 28 uh, to, to agree on, on everything. Um, then the question inside the EU, you're absolutely right. We started inside the parliament also the Article 7 procedure for Hungary. It shows actually the kind of, um, um, I myself was born in Hungary. Uh, the reason why I joined my party in 2004, the, the, that was the year of enlargement of the European Union, but because I could see the positive power that the EU had at that time to the country I was born in, uh, the country where my parents are from. And it's so sad to see that democracy is not aligned, that it's just going up. It's actually something, as we see all, all around the world, it can also go down. And these, this is a country just like Poland, with, uh, where the checks and balances and in you know, the institutions are extremely weak. And inside the EU, allowing, even inside the EU, we can see how far this can go in terms of, um, um, you know, the, the lack of independence of the judiciary, the pressure being put on journalists. Hungary, this has been happening, like Benjamin says, for over years. And we don't have effective tools. We don't have effective tools inside the EU on how to deal with it. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about this Article 7 procedure where you need, again, a unanimity of all the other countries in order to have it being invoked. And the Hungarians already said to their Polish parts, well, if it comes to the vote, we will be there on your side and the other way around. And extremely frustrating. It doesn't mean that it's not good that this is happening. But we need in the future, in a, because I think this is much big, of a much bigger threat, this erosion of democracy inside the EU than a Brexit for the future of the European Union. If we allow that the basic values, you know, on which the European Union are found can be so blatantly um, um, breached, uh, that's not a European Union I want to defend. So we will have to find tools in the future on how we can deal much better uh, with this threat. I would have liked to see this happening with Hungary, this Article 7, already years ago, then perhaps the Polish government would have thought twice 
before actually engaging in all these uh, anti-democratic uh, um, uh, issues. But the EU learns from its mistakes, but very slow, way too slow, unfortunately. Yeah, it speaks to the credibility, I guess, that we, we have as a union. Um, I think there was a second batch, right? Yeah. Well, very different question, um, well, difficult to answer, I think. But um, several European members of the European Union have large Turkish related populations who seem to have strong feelings, most of them to their families and whatever in Turkey. Uh, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, maybe France, I don't know. What should we do? Because so far we have only done negative things like forbidden, forbidding Turkish ministers to come here. I think rightly so, but how, how come we can't um, bring these groups to more positive positive towards democracy and 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 thinking brightly about what's happening there and what what they should do Tom, you want to go first <laughs> sure. oh, oh yes sorry uh, i'm not, I'm not a particularly an expert on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well uh, i think it's important in to think of, in answering your question to look at domestic uh, like how uh, again <laughs> Your, your point of reference is, of course, talking about the demonstration, uh, shaped by the demonstration that we've seen after a coup and during the refer referendum ca uh, campaign when the minister was, uh, ministers were not uh, allowed to uh, come to the Netherlands. Um, it, I think we have to realize that it's uh, uh, emphasized so much on something that might not even that big of a problem. And what I think mainly we should look at is uh, the, 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 the feelings of exclusions, uh, people uh, cheering for uh, Erdogan or, uh, or Turkey in the Netherlands have. This is often neglected, I think, uh, in simplistic media coverage. And I think the, the key is somewhere there. Like oft, many people feel mar marginalized of, of Turkish descent. I'm also generalizing now, so forgive me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, if people feel excluded and uh, here, uh, racism, discrimination, these kind of things, uh, then there's a leader who stands up and say, uh, you should be proud of your country. I mean, it's appealing for them. So, yeah, that should be dealt with domestically, I think. I think this could fill up an all kind of other session yeah. of an hour and a half, probably. <laughs> um, are there any are, remaining questions left? I think I see two here still, yeah. And maybe we should wrap up after these two, I think. I was wondering if any bolder statements made by the EU would have any direct effect on Turkey in the light of previously discussed issues of the EU legitimacy. And while on the topic of legitimacy, as far as I've read the reports of human rights um, institutions, the Turkey is also not really uh, following the judgments given by the European Court of Human Rights. So I'm wondering what actions in general will have any effect on the state. And one more question, right? Yeah, maybe let's take them both together. Um, I was wondering, because I'm not really familiar with um, the state of freedom and rights before um, it became such a hot topic uh, in the news. So I was wondering, what is it that actually um, made this huge shift? Like, is, it, has this been a long-term trend? Like, you mentioned it a little bit, but I'm trying to understand how the country has shifted to, to this point. And I know it may be a really big question, but maybe one of you can kind of summarize it to get an idea. Uh, on the question of whether uh, more stronger statements would make a difference and whether the court, the European Court, can make a difference, I mean, look, I don't think anyone should should, and I don't think any of us have have underestimated the challenge of um, trying to uh, bring about a greater respect for human rights and the rule of law in Turkey. Um, but I think in terms of the specific issue of human rights defenders, um, we, can, we can certainly point to experience, not just from Turkey, but from many countries around the world, that the more specific 
the more precise and the stronger the intervention by European Union institutions and governments, the more protection it provides to human rights defenders who are under political pressure. So I think that on that specific issue, um, th we, we can say that it does make a difference. Um, and on the court, I mean, you're right that, the, that, that Turkey doesn't um, uh, always implement the judgments of the court, that that's, that's a problem generally with the European court because it doesn't have, um, I mean, it benefits from having a, a kind of mechanism for enforcement through the, through the Committee of Ministers that other human rights courts don't have but it doesn't have, you know, a, a lot of, t of sort of tools in the toolbox um, to try to force compliance. Um, however, uh, I don't think it. I don't think that that means that it doesn't have any force, any weight, as a as an instrument for human rights. And certainly in the past, we can, you know, I've only been following Turkey closely for about ten years, but colleagues who've been following it for twenty and thirty years tell me that if you look at Turkey over the long term, including during periods when Turkey was under military control, you can say that the European Court of Human Rights has played a very positive role uh, and that, that it has been influential in Turkey. So it, it's important to see it in a kind of big picture sense, I think, rather than in relation to individual cases. Um, in relation to the European Court of Human Rights. I was talking about the European Court of Human Rights. So, I mean, I can't give you, I can't give you individual cases now, I mean, but, but uh, you know, in terms of, for example, what I was talking about earlier, which was the, the reduction of the incidence of torture in custody, the, the recommendations of the European Court of Human Rights about concrete reforms that Turkey to, could put into place to reduce that practice had an influence in reducing the amount of torture. Uh, another example, and again, one where we've seen a bit of backsliding, is the whole phenomenon of enforced disappearances. You know, the, the European Court of Human Rights, I think, was a very important uh, in finding facts about the practice of enforced disappearance by uh, Turkish state authorities, you know, in the 90s. And, you know, that did make a difference in terms of state practice going forward. That was a really big question, I think, that we uh, could wrap up with, but I'm not sure who would uh, dare to take it. <laughs> um, how how did this question. all, yeah, came about? How did it all begin? <laughs> how did it start? <laughs> and where? <laughs> I'm not a historian, uh, but a very, well, perhaps a bit simplified uh, answer, but I think one of the reasons is that President Erdogan reached a point where he can no longer democratically step back without uh, being either ending up in jail and his whole family or, or worse. Um, the, the moment, also the fight with the Gulen movement, you know, on the, on the one hand there is something I think, um, he's in power for such a long time and power after a while I think do corrupt. So it's very good we have elections every now and then because I think the more power you have and he of course also build up a whole economic power inside Turkey, also for him and his family. And this came out the moment in 2013 when he and the Gulen movement, who were working together for a couple of years um, in, in, for a long period of, of, of time and consolidating the rule of Erdogan, when they broke up and the Gulen movement came out uh, with you know, some of the information they had about his uh, illegal uh, economic practices, this was a realization. I think Erdogan kind of has to stay there until the day he is alive in order for his and his family's protection. So I think that's very simply put um, um, one of the reasons why you see even within his party he wanted to become again the chairman of the party while also being president. He wants to have full control, which he doesn't. I mean, he's not in full uh, control, but much more power than is um, than is healthy, of course, in a in a democracy. So, perhaps a very simplified answer. Um, but if he would lose next year with the election, he knows this will be not just a loss for a politician, but but you know he wouldn't be secure of his um, of his life or of him being free out of prison 
uh, neither would all of his family. And that makes it extremely difficult, if this is the reason behind it, how to address this issue of, um, of authoritarianism in the, in, in the country. Yeah. Well, I and think the other thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you made the point about, about um, you know, the, 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 the elections in 2015, the results of the elections and the fact that, you know, the, 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 the ruling party, ACT Party's share of the vote went down, it lost its absolute majority, you know, I think that's also a, a part of this is that, you know, while they were winning super majorities in parliamentary elections, perhaps it wasn't, they didn't feel necessarily the need to, you know, go after uh, critics and opponents in the same way, but once that uh, electoral advantage starts to diminish, then it, it becomes, um, seems to take on more, more focus and more imperative. I think we have to more or less wrap up. Um, we've, we've covered it a lot of ground uh, in a light manner, I, I, I guess. Uh, a lot of these topics deserve in-depth conversations, each, each of their own, uh, including, I think, the question on, on um, you know, like the, the extension to what happens elsewhere in the world, including here in the Netherlands. Uh, but also how to deal with author authoritarianism <laughs> um, that we uh, don't have time for in the next two minutes or so. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming here. I'd like to thank the, the panelists for their great contributions. And um, I hope we continue the conversation.